Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today I'd like to talk a bit about whether or not mankind is a parasite or a symbiote on the planet Earth. So let's get to it. Now in the last video I did, I talked about how urbanization and how the evolution of our species is one towards indoors and distancing ourselves from nature, essentially. And that the off-grid types, so the homesteaders, bushcrafters, survivalists, preppers, etc., are trying to more approximate an outside or rural lifestyle. In its most extreme form, we're talking about a rural off-grid homestead. Now, I did touch on a few environmental issues which appear to trigger a few people in the comments section. See, the problem is a lot of people conflate the global warming debate with man's impact on the environment. When I talk about humankind's impact on the environment, I'm not just talking about our carbon footprint. I'm talking about all other manner of influence that we've had on our planet. And in the famous words of George Carlin, I'm not so much worried about the planet, it's the people that are going to be screwed because it's our habitat that we're essentially destroying. Now, we're going to talk about some different theories whether or not this is morally admissible or not. Now, whether or not the planet is warming or whether or not it's anthropogenic, that is but one issue in the grand scheme of how man is impacting the environment. See. Uh, the mainstream has convinced people that that's the most important factor because of course at the end of that is taxation more carbon taxation now you may be a proponent of man-made global warming you may not let's just forget about that altogether for a second one cannot discount the immense amount of influence that man has had on the environment separate from that things such as species extinction which takes the form of overfishing uh, meddling with wildlife, genetic modification, the domestication of animals, which without our assistance probably couldn't survive or there'd be a very steep learning curve if they had to ever go back to the land. So the impacts of species extinction are broad and far reaching because that's our food supply. There's also the monocultural aspect, planting only a few crops. Uh, I think it's something like 90% of the fruit and vegetable varieties that existed 100 years ago don't exist today due to monoculture and big agriculture. That's going to be a significant thing in the future because nature is no longer going to have at its disposal the genetic variants that it needs in order to combat the inevitable pestilence which right now we're holding at bay with all of our drugs and our antibiotics and all the rest that we're chalking these animals full of. But eventually the floodgates on that are going to come flying open. It's just a matter of time. It's a ticking time bomb. It's only inevitable that when you have 10,000 chickens, say, under one roof, and the genetic variance isn't that far, they're all the same size, uh, all the climate's controlled, you throw one curveball through that and all those chickens are going to get wiped out instantly. And such is the case with the prophesied, and not necessarily prophesied, but predicted, scientifically predicted pandemic which is upon the horizon you have all of the man-made catastrophes like oil spills um, the Fukushima nuclear disaster you have the contamination of waterways with all the various chemicals you have electromagnetic pollution you just have the disruption of the natural environment in terms of building of cities go and look at China on Google Earth every hundred miles there's a major city in that country in order to facilitate the 1.2 billion people and I know I'm gonna probably ruffle some feathers because I'm talking a bit about overpopulation now and people are gonna bring in good old agenda 21 but we don't even need to necessarily go there because what I want to talk about is whether or not this activity is parasitic or symbiotic now some people right away they go to well it's parasitic in the sense that we are destroying the host. We are destroying the habitat which protects us. Symbiosis is when two organisms are mutually supportive of one another, or at least uh, if one organism exists within another organism, it's not gonna kill that organism. In fact, it might actually add something to it. 
it, it's very hard to argue that we're adding something to the earth. However, there's going to be one argument which is very diehard objectivist, which would defend our parasitism of the planet. And that's the notion that the goal of life, all life is evolving towards expansion, or at least that's what it seems. Some people argue that it's out of balance, but it seems as though life is piggybacking upon itself. This animal eats the plants, we eat the animal, well, I'm gonna trigger the vegans right away, but life seems to feed on life. And as such, it's like we're climbing a ladder that we've created. So if you look at ants in the jungle, they form bridges of themselves so that other ants can walk over. So perhaps in the grand scheme of things, if you will, we are all earthlings and the goal of the earthling is to get off the planet somehow, no matter what it takes in order to travel to other planets and infiltrate other planets because such is the nature of life as it wants to constantly spread and expand. So would it not then make sense that this planet would do whatever it could or, or this life force which is on this planet, it's been called Gaia, it's been called numerous things, since the original eukaryotic bacteria that existed to the most evolved species which is human beings arguably, some people might say it's dolphins or elephants or something, but let's get real, it's humans, we're the ones creating nuclear bombs. It's arguable then that the Earth is going to provide us with whatever we need to get to another planet to continue to spread and sow the seed of life. That is one potential argument. But you see, in order to understand an argument like that, we need to be more emotionally detached. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a good thing or that that's what I believe. That's just one argument. That's called devil's advocacy and it has to be done if you really want to get to the truth of things. Now, if you're one of these people who doesn't think that mankind is having some impact on the environment, not even necessarily a parasitic one, but just having an influence, having some lasting impression on the earth, then I would beseech you to consider this analogy. Now, a virus is an incredibly small thing, and a virus has the capability to kill a human being, which relative to the size of the virus is really like the size of, like it's like comparing me to the size of the sun. That's how big that virus is in comparison to our bodies. So it's it's negligible. And if you were to add up all of the matter that comprise those viruses within a human body, say of a influenza virus that, that kills a human being, it would probably only add up to a couple milligrams at best. It probably, it, the actual weight of it is probably much less than that. Yet, in spite of that, it still has the ability to completely destroy the host. You see where I'm getting at? So yes, well, we are incredibly small relative to the size of the planet. Don't underestimate our capacity to influence our surroundings. Just like that one little virus, something the size of me relative to the sun, in the same way, we can do the same thing to the planet. So are we having an impact on the environment? Well, obviously we're having an impact on the environment. It's stupid not to think that we are. Is nature resilient? Of course it is. If we were to go away today, if every human being on this planet died today, the earth would heal itself probably within a few years. Whatever you think constitutes healing itself, that just means more different types of species would come about, different types of gen genetic mutations could happen because everything wasn't as controlled as it is now, and the biodiversity could continue to flourish. But right now, we're, we're putting a lid on biodiversity because biodiversity essentially threatens our inside lives, as I hinted at in that last video. So the question for me really isn't, are we having an impact on the environment? I think that's a no-brainer. People who use this ridiculous statistic about how every human being on Earth can fit in Texas 
and I'll have like an acre of land or something like that. I can't remember what the exact statistic is. It fails to take into consideration so many factors uh, with respect to, you know, how much arable land there is, what our rates of consumption are, and all the rest. And indeed, we could be managing things a lot better, and the earth could probably support a much larger population. I don't dispute that. However, on the current economic trajectory that we're on now, I don't think that it's going to be sustainable. It's not even really that it's necessarily unsustainable right now, because we could milk the earth of oil for probably another hundred years and be fine. Uh, who knows what the other toxic effects of that are going to be on us. We're seeing cancer rates skyrocket, and as the saying goes, as, as above, so below. But the fact is, there's so much energy to be had elsewhere and as much as i embrace many aspects of the free market one can't deny that it has prevented technology from evolving in a lot of ways now competition drives innovation to some extent but it, there comes to a point when people start buying up patents and things become monopolized that that ceases and all of those inventions which might provide people with cleaner energy which is more unlimited gets suppressed in the name of continuing profits and that's exactly what happens if you don't think that that's what happens in the corporate boardroom doing whatever you can at all costs to maximize profits that's exactly what happens i'm not anti-free market you could argue the whole thing it's a terrible system but it's the best system we got and I don't necessarily think that state-run institutions are that efficient either because what happens with any state-run institution is that in order to justify their budgets the next year and for everybody to keep their jobs, you have to keep the social problems alive. You know, the police don't want to get their budget cut, so heaven forbid crime goes down. You know, social workers don't want to lose their jobs, so heaven forbid the poor come out of poverty things of that nature you need the problem it to be sustained so the problem never gets fixed with state-run institutions that's the downfall of that now if you got rid of the the crap in both of these approaches maybe just maybe we could get ourselves out of this predicament that we're in but i assure you we are having an impact on the environment and if you want to go to the extent to say that we are virulent we are a virus that's infecting the planet, that's going to destroy it, then maybe we're not a quick pandemic influenza virus that kills the host right away. Maybe we're the kind of virus that weakens the immune system for years and years. And then finally a common cold kills you, like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. Maybe we're more like that. Not all viruses are the same, so a lot of people you know, if they don't see that the negative consequences right away, they just presume that, oh, well, you know, that the world is resilient and will bounce back. And, you know, they look at these large swaths of uh, pristine forests, which are protected areas, which if they weren't protected, would probably be knee deep in oil by now or have uh, companies out there trying to exploit them for some purpose. But as an honest seeker of truth, I cannot logically disprove the objectivist viewpoint which would say that even if we have to kill every single other species on this planet and completely terraform, bioengineer through nanotechnology and all the rest our own organic matter in order to fuel our bodies and our civilization, it would be justified because it meant spreading the seed of life to other planets. That's the end game, interstellar warp drive. The interstellar warp drive is the end game. And then who knows, maybe after that, time or dimension travel is the end game. I'm not really sure. And you know, by that point, we're probably gonna be so, we're probably not gonna be biological beings, realistically. Um, many people have prophesied that if you invented AI, that the AI would just go and explore the cosmos. So that if we do come in contact with life, it would have been artificial life, which was engineered because uh, the whole idea with artificial intelligence and the singularity is that 
you make a machine so intelligent that it can start creating its own machines and it becomes conscious and it gets smarter and smarter at an exponential rate until it inevitably becomes a god and it, it knows everything there is to know in the universe so maybe that's the whole riddle of life itself is that you know you start off knowing absolutely nothing and the whole end goal is to create something perhaps because we're not capable our minds are not capable of knowing even a, a small sliver fraction of what there is to know in the known universe much less the unknown universe so perhaps our goal is to create beings robots some artificial cybernetic plasma of sorts which is all-knowing and can travel the cosmos without the need for spaceships so within this view this emotional attachment that we have to the earth is really just a hindrance towards our evolution on the other hand one could argue that it's our human bonds and it is that passion that we have for life that that thing within you that makes you want to cry when you see something that you think is sad everybody has a different standard for what can make them sad we all have attachment to certain things i have attachment to my children people have attachment to their friends without that bond we would have never gotten to this point from that argument then it's not just about dog eat dog it's not just about the end game there is something essential absolutely essential about cooperating and about having some measure of respect for other life forms not for any wishy-washy care bear empathy type purpose but because it's a necessity for things to evolve because things can't evolve in isolation you need two actors interacting with one another in order to create some synergistic outcome which might be different from what you had before that's what evolution is two different things come together create something new this happens millions and millions of times over and over again and you might be asking yourself that if i'm capable of entertaining such objectivist cold views in spite of the fact that i, I recognize that man is impacting the environment if you're wondering why I would be so concerned with preparedness and survival, knowing what I know and what I don't know about life and death and being an agnostic and all the rest. And the truth is, I don't know. But all I know is that I must survive. It almost seems like a, a self-evident truth that I must survive at all costs. That my survival is the, the survival of the species. And I think on a spiritual level, that's what a lot of preppers and survivalists are missing here. That survivalism isn't just about stockpiling supplies so you can continue to just live for the sake of living. We are a part of something much bigger than you or I. We don't know what we're a part of, but there is a life force of which we're a part. Our survival isn't just the survival of ourselves, it's the survival of the species. And it's really easy to just take for granted that notion when times are good and there's 7 billion of us walking around. But really, 7 billion people in all of the galaxies, in all of the planetary systems, in all of the universes for all we know, maybe there's a multiverse, isn't that much. 7 billion people isn't that much yet. It seems like a lot, but in the infinite cosmic ocean, it's really uh, not even a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket is not a worthy comparison. 7 billion people is not a lot, and your survival is important. Everything we do is consequential. There's a never-ending butterfly effect that is happening right now just by existing. You listening to me right now has altered your future in some way. And if I alter 2,000 people's future, and that future alters thousands upon thousands more people's futures, just look at that symphony of confluence that happens thereafter. It's a, it's a beautiful thing 
life, and indeed, we are significant. That's why survival is so important at all costs. And that's why you have that feeling within you that you have to survive because it's not just you that's alive. It's the life force that is trying to keep you alive. And that is something which is shared by the dogs, the cats, the crickets, the plants. We all possess that same life force. And that's the life force of the earthling. Where did that life force come from? Some people say it was seeded by comets, just like a sperm smashes into an egg, penetrates and, and creates something that grows and grows and grows and eventually itself gets up and walks and moves somewhere else. Maybe we're in the infancy, maybe we haven't learned how to walk yet. Anyways, I know I've probably confused the heck out of some people, but uh, thanks for listening to my rambling if you listen this long. And continue to prepare, continue to live life, continue to enjoy life, enjoy those moments. But take heed that if we are a parasite, then we may well be up Shit's Creek without a paddle. And as far as I can tell, everybody's arguing about which seat they get in the boat. Thanks for watching Canadian Barbaro.